And thanks for joining us for this segment of Heat and the Helix. I'm joined today by Dr. Lynn Jordy. Dr. Lynn Jordy is the co-director for the Center for Genomic Medicine. He's also the chair for the Department of Human Genetics at the School of Medicine here at the U. And he's the holder of the Mark and Kathy Miller Presidential Endowed Chair in Human Genetics. Uh, and today we are joining, uh, uh, what is this, the honey flavored sriracha from Fat Dogs, uh, having a little treat there. Uh, and very much looking forward to enjoying this with you. Dr. Jordy, thank you so much for being here. It's a pleasure, Steve. Excellent. And hey, well, I'm, I'm uh, glad that we get to have this, uh, what is it, the, the sweet uh, experience, this one. We've had a lot of smoky and savory recently in the show. So let's try this, uh, this new one out. Okay, here we go. Here we go. Hopefully this doesn't Niagara fall on me. Oh my, yep. Yeah, that's a thin sauce. Cheers, sir. Okay, cheers. Mm. Oh yeah. Goes nicely with a little bit of grilled chicken. Oh yeah, I bet. We're at level three now. So nothing too insane yet. And you seem to be holding it well. <laughs> <laughs> well, Steve, I can still talk. So I think we're hey, okay. <laughs> that's the litmus test, we're done. That's great. Perfect. Well, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy you're here because we've, we've talked um, to Lorenzo, Dr. Lorenzo Bado about the Penelope program. We have had a chance to talk to Dr. Capron about what CGM, Center for Genomic Medicine, is. And uh, you, Dr. Jordi, you have a wealth of, of experience and knowledge in seeing uh, the entire evolution, pretty much, of genetics and genomics. Um, and so I, I, I just really would like to hear your, your perspective on what things have changed since maybe the start of your career uh, towards maybe now. And especially uh, if you could talk about your work on Miller syndrome and, and perhaps use that as an example of how things have changed over time. Sure. Well, Steve, I took my first human genetics course as an undergraduate back in 1973. So almost 50 years ago, the textbook was very, very well written. And I, I, I literally couldn't put it down. And I guess that's when I realized that human genetics was a good fit for me. I did my PhD thesis using blood groups like ABO and RH uh, and uh, something called protein polymorphisms. But these were um, very, very limited in terms of the information they could provide us. So at that time, the thought of sequencing a whole human genome with the tools we had back then, it would have been kind of like trying to build the Empire State Building with nothing but stone tools. It's just impossible. So I came to Utah in 1979. It was my first faculty position in the Department of Pediatrics in the Division of Medical Genetics. And at that time, uh, our tools were still pretty primitive. Uh, that meant that for most genetic conditions, we just had no way of understanding the underlying cause because we couldn't sequence genomes. Now in 1981, uh, I learned about Heather and Logan Madsen, the two children who were in fact the first instance in which Miller syndrome had recurred in a family. Uh, there were only a few other cases known in the world. Uh, and of course, one of the things that we talked about at the time was whether this might be a genetic condition. But we had no way of knowing that. We had no way of actually identifying a gene that would cause Miller syndrome. Uh, and that remained the case for about three decades. Now, seven years after I learned about Heather and Logan in the pediatric genetics clinic, uh, just by chance, a total coincidence, I met their mother, uh, Debbie. Uh, in fact, she came up to me at a party and said, I hear you're a geneticist. And I said, yes. And she said, do you know anything about postaxial acrofacial dysostosis? And I'm pretty sure she thought she would stump me with that question, but I had actually heard of it. And when she told me about her children, the Miller syndrome kids, I remembered them from our clinic. Well, um, we had a lot of other things in common as well. Uh, and we have now been together for almost 34 years. Uh, and something that, of course, always interested me was the cause of that condition in her two kids. It was always really troubling to her, to them, to not have an answer, to not know why 
this condition had occurred in them, uh, to not know what their risk would be of having more ch of ha having children of their own that would have this condition. Well, in about 2008, it finally became possible and affordable to start sequencing whole genomes. And I was working with a group that really wanted to sequence the very first human family. Um, one of the things that that would allow would be estimation for the first time of the rate at which human mutations occur, uh, passed on from parent to offspring. But we also thought, well, it would be really interesting to do this with a family that had a genetic condition or a condition that we thought was genetic, but where the gene had not yet been identified. Well, uh, Debbie's family, her two children and her first husband were a natural choice for that exercise. Uh, we undertook whole genome sequencing of the four of them. Uh, and they became, in fact, the very first family in history to have their whole genome sequenced. So uh, that uh, sequencing uh, and some of that work was done by a former postdoc of mine, Mike Bombshad at the University of Washington. Um, he did what's called exome sequencing. And it was that that pinpointed uh, the mutation uh, in a gene that actually causes Miller syndrome. So after 30 years of not having an answer, uh, finally, my wife, her kids did get an answer to the cause of their condition. Uh, and for me, being a small part of that, well, it was, a, it was an exercise in personal genomics. And it really convinced me of the value of whole genome sequencing, that if we could do, succeed with this family, we could succeed with others. That's a remarkable story. And thank you so much for sharing that. It really does get to the core of what a lot we've been talking about is finding, finding new ways to, to really transform medicine through genomics. Uh, your expertise in human genomics is known, genomics rather, is known far and wide in the scientific community. Uh, you're also the uh, previous uh, president for the American Society for Human Genetics. And so you've, you've seen uh, uh, quite, quite the scene uh, of, of what's going on right now in genetics and genomics. Why, why Utah? Why come, why come here for, for your, uh, what's been an extended career here in the state? Um, yeah, uh, there's a single word answer to that question, families. Utah has the largest uh, collection of family data uh, in the Utah population database, we have more than 10 million people linked into very large pedigrees, some of them having thousands of people. And in some of those pedigrees, there is a substantial excess of a specific genetic disease. Uh, and not only do we have the data, but just as importantly, our Utah families are famously cooperative. When we approach them to participate in these studies, the great majority of time, of the time, they say yes, they're happy to do it. Uh, and some of my colleagues who live in other parts of the country are astounded by the participation rates we see here in Utah. Uh, so without these families, uh, without the data, uh, without their extraordinary willingness to participate in studies, we couldn't accomplish what we do. Uh, but Utah, uh, that's one of the many reasons why this has been such a good place to do human genetics. Well, thank you for bringing up the point about the community here, because I mean, there's we take there's so many exciting things going on in the technology and in the science that it's it's really uh, easy to talk about them. Um, but the human aspect, the fact at the end of the day, we're talking about human DNA. This comes from people and collaborations with them. Um, I think is really something that uh, brings it full circle to mm -hmm. to uh, really the grassroots, the family, the community, the people out there we're trying to serve. And thank you so much for being a part of that history and for sharing yours with us today. Um, it's been really a pleasure talking to you. It's a pleasure to talk with you, Steve, and now I'll finish my chicken. Well, hey, yeah. And while, <laughs> while uh, uh, Dr. Jordy is uh, enjoying some hot sauce and chicken, thank you to all those out there who have supported so far and who will continue to support us for You Giving Day. We have more series coming up with more interviews, so we hope to see you there. And in the meantime, hope you're doing well, stay safe and healthy, and thanks again. Thank you, Steve. 
To learn more and hear the full interview, follow the audio-only link in the description below.